Bom, é, tá gravando. Boa noite, boa noite todo mundo. Um prazer aqui novamente a gente nosso segundo encontro desse ano. Estamos mantendo nossa meta de, de ter um encontro por mês, né? É, isso é muito importante para gente, pelo menos isso, né? Um encontro por mês. E hoje é um dia muito especial porque a gente tem é, dois convidados muito especiais e hoje também é uma realização de uma das nossas frentes, que é o Work Group de Identidade Auto Soberana. Né? Então, é, antes da gente começar, só para lembrar que a gente tem um código de ética, que é o código de ética da Fundação, é, que basicamente diz para a gente ter respeito pra, com os, os nossos colegas, né, os participantes e os palestrantes, então evitar qualquer tipo de é, colocação que possa ter cunho é, um pouco que, que fuja essa esse respeito, né? Então vamos começar, está sendo gravado. Depois a gente vai disponibilizar é, as gravações de, de forma definitiva no capítulo. É, Para começar hoje, só relembrando, né? Nós estamos aqui, nós temos um capítulo, né? No Brasil, é, esse capítulo é uma um projeto é totalmente aberto, que a Fundação criou para ajudar é, a comunidade a se desenvolver no Brasil. Então, a gente tem aqui é, pessoas, né? eu, Paulo Simões, Fernando Marino, Galdino, Risco Outro, Madeira, que a gente lidera esse capítulo já há dois, há dois anos, né? e temos frentes regionais, né? é, que seriam os grupos regionais que trabalham é, para que a gente se desenvolva. E, a gente está começando esse ano um conceito que são os grupos de trabalho, é, que são é, 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 colegas né, que tentam focar num, num um assunto específico, né, para desenvolver esse assunto com mais profundidade. E a gente tem dois grupos de trabalho, um para documentação, que o, que o Renato Teixeira tá, tá tomando, tem a frente, a liderança, e outra identidade soberana que o Fernando Marino tem a liderança. Tá? Eu gostaria de falar com vocês, aproveitar, né, é, dizer que é, semana passada nós tivemos um evento né, para o setor, fomos convidados, o capítulo foi convidado a participar no evento, até o Bernardo também teve nesse evento, para o setor de energia no Brasil, e fizemos um convite para esse, esse pessoal do setor de energia rostear um, um grupo de interesse, que a gente chama de Special Interest Group, para o setor de energia. Eles gostaram muito da ideia, então a gente vai começar a conversar para isso tornar realidade. E a segunda boa notícia também é que a gente está... É, também tentando fundar uma perninha desse work, de work group para, é, o, com foco em é, inspirar mulheres a trabalhar com o Hyperledger Foundation. Tá? É, aí a gente já está em conversação com algumas pessoas, né, com algumas líderes né, nessa frente, para que a gente possa, na próxima reunião, ter já alguma coisa assim. Quem tiver interesse, Sempre está aberto para participação. O mailing list está aqui no site, né, na, na apresentação. Community Brasil Chapter at lists.hyperledger.org. Tem um canal no Rocket Chat chamado Community Brasil. Tá? É, e vou passar a bola aqui agora para o Renato Teixeira, que ele vai fazer uma breve explanação do, do, do trabalho que o capítulo que o Work Group de Documentação já está fazendo, maravilhoso, e depois disso a gente vai seguir com o Fernando liderando aí, o Fernando é, Marino liderando aí com o assunto de identidade soberana. Tá bom, pessoal? Obrigado. É, Renato, é contigo, vou, vou parar de fazer o sharing aqui, tá bom? Ok, obrigado, Paulo. Bom, pessoal, eu queria falar rapidamente sobre o Grupo de Trabalho de Documentação, meu nome é Renato Teixeira, é, já podem ver a minha, a minha tela já? Já consegue perfeito, ver aqui? Renato. Tá perfeito. Meu nome é Renato Teixeira, eu estou liderando essa iniciativa de tradução da documentação da Hyperled, da Hyperled para a língua portuguesa. Esse, esse work group, ele veio, ele se originou aqui do, do capítulo e foi interessante perceber que foi num timing bem adequado, porque hoje a o foco do grupo de documentação é exatamente diminuir as barreiras 
da, de acesso ao Hyperledger seja uh, uh, por, um, por meio de, de samples, por exemplo, ou por meio da documentação. E esse é, esse é o objetivo da nossa iniciativa no Brasil. O que, que é essencialmente o nosso trabalho? Tá? O nosso trabalho é realmente fazer a tradução da documentação em inglês, que é uma documentação que, que é a base de todo mundo, para a língua portuguesa, obviamente ajustando algumas características de tradução, ajustando algumas questões regionais, para garantir que é, mais pessoas no Brasil têm acesso. A gente tem que entender que a, a questão da, da leitura do inglês não é algo natural para para uma grande parte da população, e a gente tendo uma, uma documentação na nossa língua nativa, torna o acesso muito mais simples e permite a gente ampliar o número de pessoas que podem estar envolvida com a tecnologia de alguma maneira, seja é, consumindo a tecnologia, seja ajudando a desenvolver a tecnologia. O uh, Workgroup Brasil, do, 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 de trabalho do Brasil, tem uma página dentro do Wiki da, da Hyperledger, é a página onde a gente concentra todas as informações a, a, aqui do trabalho que a gente está realizando. E o primeiro resultado desse trabalho, que foi que assim que a gente ingressou uh, com essa atividade, a gente passou a apoiar as iniciativas e a gente se tornou a, a terceira língua a ser traduzida, a ter um, processo, um projeto de tradução. A primeira foi o chinês, a segunda, na mesma semana, foi uh, um, um idioma indiano, uma, um, um dos idiomas da Índia, né? e agora a língua portuguesa. E a gente tem feito um trabalho bem interessante em cima disso, tanto que se criou, a partir da nossa entrada, um repositório no GitHub, que é especificamente para a internacionalização da documentação da Hyperledger para inúmeras línguas, onde tem hoje a chinesa, que é uma língua que uma documentação que já está bem avançada na tradução, tem a nossa brasileira, que já, a primeira versão da nossa língua brasileira que já está lá, entre a, a, a Malaya, e já se tem informações que outras línguas, como o espanhol, por exemplo, também vão entrar. Então, o, o meu objetivo hoje aqui, além de mostrar um pouquinho do que a gente está fazendo, né, do, do trabalho que a gente vem executando, seja no grupo aqui do capítulo, seja com o grupo de documentação global, onde a gente interage em questões de como desenvolver o material, como evoluir o material, abordagens que a gente pode ter, também tem um pouco do resultado, ou seja, a gente já tem um conjunto de, de, de informações traduzidas, onde eu, eu gostaria de ter mais colaboradores para ajudar, seja traduzindo, seja revisando, seja colaborando com, com questões conceituais, enfim, uh, quanto mais pessoas estiverem junto com a gente aqui, maior vai ser a nossa capacidade de ampliar e, e conseguir fazer com que a gente amplie uh, o acesso à, à documentação da Hyperledger no Brasil. O que, que eu, a gente já tem pronto e foi algo que a gente desenvolveu junto, né? A gente tem toda a parte introdutória do blockchain já é, traduzida, Uh, onde tem uma série de conceitos super interessantes para quem não tem ideia do que, do que é um blockchain que já está é, em português, falta agora exatamente de uma revisão, então a gente começa a buscar apoio exatamente para poder avançar nesses aspectos. Todo o glossário foi traduzido já, a gente tem todo o glossário da plataforma na língua portuguesa, e eu, <coughs> eu tenho trabalhado na na parte agora dos conceitos é, dos conceitos chaves da plataforma. Eu já tenho um, um bom conjunto de documentos já traduzidos, agora estou fazendo a parte de tradução do, do, uh, de contatos inteligentes e chain code, e o, o, o mais importante aqui é, é um processo muito simples de se fazer. A documentação toda é baseada em Markdown, ou, uh, ou, ou Recomark, que é simplesmente um, um texto onde você tem alguns marcadores, é algo muito simples de se trabalhar, e você tem acesso a, a, a ele e consegue fazer a tradução de maneira muito simples. Então, eu tenho aqui um exemplo, onde eu estou onde eu trabalhando na documentação do que é um, um smart contract, né? Então, eu, eu parei de traduzir aqui, eu tenho aqui um bloquinho a mais para traduzir. Então, a tradução desse texto que a gente está lendo aqui, né? Que a gente está vendo a documentação todo formatado, nada mais é do que uma linha de texto com algumas marcações, onde você tem que fazer a tradução, manter as marcações, usando alguns conceitos de manter, algum, alguns termos não, não, não podem ser traduzidos, porque senão não faria sentido, termos que fazem referência para a imagem. Negócio muito simples. A compilação também é um processo extremamente simples, ele é baseado em Python, tem todo um gerenciador de, uh, de, de ambiente das, das, das bibliotecas e tudo mais que você precisa usar. Então, a compilação é um processo muito simplificado. Feita essa, essa, essa compilação, você já pode ver aqui, por exemplo, aqui nesse bloco, você pode ver a tradução que você colocou. Opa, não está salvo. Tem que salvar. Então, salvamos aqui. 
Vamos ver se está salvo. Aí sim vai aparecer. Então, é um processo super tranquilo de se fazer. Então, agora a gente atualizando aqui, a gente tem a tradução de uma maneira super simplificada. Não tem nenhuma ciência de foguete por detrás. E a gente está abrindo, tá abrindo portas para um número, grupo de pessoas que vão passar a ter acesso à documentação. Então, é, essencialmente era isso que eu queria falar. Falar que é um, é um trabalho é, super interessante. Existe um grupo muito grande de, de, uh, de pessoas envolvidas que estão fazendo esse, esse material acontecer. É um material muito rico. Eu estou trabalhando nele uh, já faz três semanas. Eu posso afirmar, é um material riquíssimo em detalhes, referências cruzadas, informações, é, é, explicação do porquê as coisas acontecem, a mudança de uma tecnologia outra, para outra, por que aconteceu. Então, se você está interessado em aprender sobre tecnologia, ou se você está interessado em a, a ajudar outras pessoas a terem acesso à tecnologia, fica aí meus contatos, estou à disposição, fala comigo, a gente começa a trabalhar junto, todo o material é aberto, é no GitHub, tem todo um processo simples de fazer para você atualizar, e eu estou total dispor para colaborar com quem quiser fazer parte dessa, dessa iniciativa, que tem sido bastante interessante da minha parte, tá ok? Obrigado, e eu vou passar agora a palavra para o Fernando. Muito obrigado, Renato. Uh, pessoal, agora eu vou trocar rapidinho para o inglês aqui, tá? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our speakers of this Hyperledger Chapter Brazil Meetup. Uh, uh, John and Stephen, thank you, guys. And also to extend this thank you to this thank Uh, well, in the meetup, John, it's challenging, and then Stephen will speak about Hyperledger Ares project, right? Um, okay, well. Uh, Correct, really? yes. Great, thank you, Stephen. Well, guys, you know, we all believe that one of the most interesting things and disruptive things that is being uh, created with blockchain is the concept of self sovereign identity, we're betting hide on that here in Brazil. So thank you again. Uh, now we'll switch to Portuguese to make some announcement, a brief announcement regarding our work, our work group of uh, self sovereign identity that we are just creating right now in Brazil, okay? Just a sec. Bom, pessoal, uh, eu gostaria também de convidá-los aí a todos né, para participar do grupo de identidade digital descentralizada que nós estamos criando aqui no Brasil, né, a identidade digital auto soberana. É um grupo onde nós estamos discutindo os protocolos, os conceitos e aplicações aqui no Brasil. Então, todos estão convidados aí para participar, tanto no Rocket Chat, quanto também no próprio grupo de Hyperledger do Capítulo Brasil, que nós temos no WhatsApp. Estão todos convidados. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to join to start our meetup of today. Thank you. Ok, my turn. Your turn, John. Ok, it's a real pleasure to be here in Brazil. It's super easy to get here by uh, Zoom. Um, so thank you very much. Um, my name is John Jordan and I work for the province of British Columbia. So that's a, um, the westernmost province in, the, in Canada. And uh, you know, I work with Stephen, uh, who the two of us, we've been at this for almost four years now, um, from kind of the early days of Hyperledger Indie and to today. So I think what we've agreed upon, I don't know if Fernando, this is exactly what you had envisioned, but I'm going to talk a bit about the, uh, the general problem we're trying to solve, you know, sort of in particular from the government's perspective and how we think that can um, empower our citizens and our businesses. And I'll do a little demo um, for uh, like showing a sort of a use case that we're doing with the lawyers in BC and Law Society. And um, then Stephen will talk uh, more about the uh, underlying technology. Looks so, good. Um, Great. I will, uh, you know, um, please feel free to um, ask questions and to tell me to, you know, say slow down or, or something like this if, um, you know, if I'm not speaking clearly or too quickly or whatever to try and be, you know, respectful of the fact that, uh, you know, English is my first language and probably your second or third or something. So I think, can you see my screen? I don't see the, you see like a British Columbia logo? Okay, great. 
So uh, I'll just I'll go through a few slides, you know, to to situate the problem and talk about this new pattern. Um, you know, you call it self-sovereign identity. We're starting to call it even more generally trust over IP. And then Stephen will go into the uh, details. So first, I'm going to talk a bit about you know the way things are without computers. Um, it's simpler, <laughs> but you know we like computers, so we're going to add them into the story later. But you know we know what an in-person credential is, something that we're holding in our wallet that we have in our filing folder. We were given things from government, from banks, from our local membership club, maybe the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu club, I don't know. And we know how to use those and, they, and people know what they mean. And they understand that those pieces of, um, those credentials, those pieces of evidence have been given to us by an authority of some kind that they are going to decide to trust. And we call that governance. So these are the rules by which we receive our driver's license, our citizenship card, our bank card, our membership card, our law, law society, you know, lawyer, uh, library card. And they're presented to us on the technology, you know, like, a, like in nowadays, a high security printed thing. But maybe hundreds of years ago, printing was enough because being able to print was a very expensive thing and it, was easy, it wasn't easy to forge. And we know that this is a very common pattern that we see all the time, although we might not think of it this way all the time. We have a rule called issuer. Issuers are the authorities that, that give us something that we can use and hold and have to present to other places when we need to prove something about ourselves. So I receive a piece of plastic and I don't have it on me, but I have my driver's license. We call it a services card in BC. And the reason I have that is because I went to the government, I presented evidence of who I am. They took my picture. They did a bunch of facial recognition and stuff to make sure they're sure that I'm the right person to give me this high security card. And then I use that to gain access to services, renting cars and so forth and so on. The reason that trust occurs is because that issuance occurs under the law. We just call that governance. And we have a whole bunch of ways that we use to increase the insurance, assurance of these trusted interactions. You know, back in the day it was wax seals and then it became signatures and then we could fax them and we have witnessing ceremonies and a variety of ceremonies that we do in our day-to-day -day lives to indicate that a particular interaction is, is trustworthy and, and, and asserted. And of course, I mentioned the, the, the role of government. You know, we have foundational roles like birth certificates, death certificates, driver's licenses, and all kinds of other types of registrations, legal entity registrations. A business can't say that it exists and enter into contracts without being registered with, you know, the government. And, you know, financial service model, this is just an example of a financial transaction payment network where there's a governance model. MasterCard is in this case, the governing body. They have issuers, banks issue credit cards to citizens, to, to customers, their card holders. Those both have agreements. And then the card holders use that card to make payments or to make purchases. And the merchant verifies that card. And that's also happening under governance. And you know, so this is something that we understand. Then we introduced computers. And we introduce some new things into our sort of day-to-day -day life. Well, first, you know, there's some value to these computers, it turns out, although they can be quite frustrating. Um, they, um, they, they automate a bunch of processes and so forth. But when we look at the very big picture, we look at the internet, it's not a very safe place. We don't have ways of doing things that are trusted like we can do in our day-to-day -day lives. There's this big trust gap. We can do some things on the internet that seem trustworthy, like we can buy stuff or there's this online advertising, but really those are two kinds of models like the buying things. Well, if you're part of the credit card trust framework, you know, then you're in. If you're not, a, if you're not able to have a credit card, you're not in. And that isn't very great from a government point of view. Like we want to include all of our citizens and services. And we have this other model for making money, which is basically the surveillance economy. Um, and so that also comes along with a whole bunch of other risks and, and unfortunate side effects of this technology, which is, you know, the, uh, the many passwords we have, the risks to our personal information being stolen and our identity being um, uh, taken from us and used by others and so forth. 
Um, there's some problems with the way we try and have done things with government. Uh, you know, it's difficult to orchestrate um, a set of services for a citizen and so forth. And the big challenge I think that, that, that we've stumbled over and now I think we can point to very clearly is that um, the, the client server model of the web and of sort of enterprise computing, it doesn't work for trust. And the reason it doesn't work for trust is because the account service is owned by somebody outside of our influence and control. The account service exists because in the beginning, computers required you to access them to share their expensive resource. And that access was in a controlled physical facility, often a government or a university or a corporation. And that controlled physical access relied on in-person credentials to be able to know who that person was and that they were authorized to be in the room where they could then do this new login thing. And when we were able to have many more computers and we were able to do that remotely, we never figured out how to replace that trust model where we relied on in-person credentials and connect it to a login. And then we have all those other problems with login. So this is like the root cause. And then, you know, I don't know if it'll make sense, but instead of the technology model here is client server, which means that the server sends information bits to the client on my computer. But from a governance perspective, me as the client, it's like what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to engage in a trusted interaction. I can't do that with anything, anyone or any other service that isn't connected to the account service that I'm using right now. And so it's more like I'm in service of the server. I call it the client servitude model. It's not peer to peer. It's somebody else is managing my relationships and that's fundamentally broken. How can we fix that? Well, we have this new model where we think we can establish peer to peer digital trust. So we can have peer to peer connections back again to having a direct relationship with the issuer. But instead of a plastic secure item, I get a cryptographically secure thing we call a verifiable credential. Stephen will talk about that. And I'm gonna get that credential through a, a new uh, protocol, a new channel called a DIDCOM channel and a new connection. And then I'm gonna be able to hold and keep these things myself. And I'm gonna be able to present them to third parties when they need to know something about me and from an issuer that they trust under the governance models that we already have. And I'm going to be able to gain access to that service. And I'm gonna do that in a way that it allows me to uh, make those decisions myself, decide to share the things that are being requested, and do that privately, peer to peer. There's no intermediary here. So I'll give an example and then I'll do a quick demo of that and then we'll hand it off to uh, Stephen for the you know, gory details of how this works uh, using Hyperledger technology that, that we've been uh, contributing to. So this is the question of, am I a lawyer? So we often need to prove something about ourselves that has to do with an accreditation we hold. I'm an employee, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm a teacher, I'm a parent, something like this. So I'm a lawyer. And in BC, we have an organization called the Law Society of British Columbia that is created by an act of parliament. And their responsibility is to decide who are lawyers and they have a criteria for that. Law degrees, exams, membership fees, and so forth. And they maintain the membership lists, list and they give to lawyers a practicing certificate. So a physical object that says they're a lawyer in good standing for this period of time. And lawyers can use that to present to services to prove they're a lawyer. And in this case, we're gonna look at a BC court service that wants to provide a record, digitally recorded audio sessions of court proceedings. So their clients, you know, they need this to do research for their clients for bail review hearings and other kinds of sessions. The BC government would like to give those recordings only to lawyers. And so they need to know who of that lawyer, that they are a lawyer. We have some options. We could do this in person. We know how to do this. They have a practicing certificate. They have government issued ID. They can prove who they are. That they're a lawyer. They can get the recording, say on a CD or a USB stick or something. Okay, but BC is a very big province, just like Brazil is a very big country. We don't want everybody to have to come to one place or a small number of places. And you know, we can see all the reasons this is not ideal. Two, current computing technology, we have a login of some kind. Now, the problem is BC Court Services has a challenge. They don't know 
which login service they could use. The BC Law Society has a login for their membership portal. The BC government has a general user account service called BCE ID. No assurance there. We don't know who they are. It doesn't know who they're a lawyer. It's just a login. And we also have something in BC called the BC Service Card, which is a login service that is able to access your government issued identity attributes. So we've registered all our residents. We know who they are. We have their pictures. We can give them a login service on their phone that's high assurance. The problem is BC Court Service doesn't care that who you are really. They care that you're a lawyer. And the, law, and the law society, well, in theory, you could integrate with that login account, but when that lawyer needs to go and prove they're a lawyer to the land registry or to the business registry or to a bank, is every service in the world that needs to know who a BC lawyer is going to integrate with the BC law society through some point to point open ID connect interaction. That's going to be really ugly. Um, so option three, what if we could give the lawyer just like in real world, give them a practicing certificate, but give them a cryptographic version of it, a verifiable credential. And what if they could present that proof of holding that credential to the BC court service and the BC court service could ask for that without having to integrate with the law society. We can take a look at that. So I'm going to show you on my phone here. that understand these uh, um, Stevens is going to talk about hyperledger these agents. I'm going to use one so I can see here that I'm being offered a credential, not very creatively named. I'll talk about that to our friend Emiliano. Um, and I can accept that digital practicing certificate and tuck that into my wallet. So now I can look in my wallet and I can see I have a card. Oops, I can see I have a card here called A2A TOIP, but really what it should say is digital practicing certificate. And I can look into it and I can see what attributes are there. And this is a cryptographically signed chunk of data stored in my secure wallet. And I can now, you know, walk around with that. It's right here. Now I can go over to the BC court service who knows that these credentials are out there and being held by lawyers. They know that the law society is diligently managing their membership list and they know how to ask a lawyer to prove that they're, um, uh, prove that they're a lawyer. And they do this by saying, present your verifiable credential. Now this particular implementation is actually integrated with an enterprise um, identity access management platform called Keycloak. And so what we've done is we, for the pattern where you need to ask your customer who they are and what it is they are holding to get in, say their account number or something, that's kind of like a login, it's an authentication. So they're gonna authenticate with their verifiable credential. Um, but your web app may just wanna understand OpenID Connect, which is a great pattern for you know, getting people into the game and not having to build uh, more into these web apps than, than, than you need. You just need to know they're a lawyer. I can say, I'm going to prove. Oh, awesome! I'm going to prove uh, who I am. There we go. Um, so this is a challenge that says, "Prove to me you're a lawyer." I scan that with my phone. On my phone, it has looked up into my wallet to see if they have a verifiable credential that matches the criteria specified in this QR code, and I do. So I'm being asked to prove my lawyer number, my name, and my membership status. I present that, and I am now authenticated into the BC Court transcript service, and I can see my name here and so forth. So it's that simple for a lawyer to pick up their credential and to use it to gain access to a system the system did not require any kind of integration. Um, um, the, I mean, the, uh, the BC court service didn't have to integrate 
um, with the law society. They didn't even have to talk to the law society. Um, they simply, um, I'll show you a sort of high level diagram. So the law society added what's called a Aries cloud agent Python into their configuration. They're actually using a 1990s technology called cold fusion to run their membership portal. So you can work with old technology, you can work with new technology, as long as this interface can, you know, your back end can send data into a, a uh, Aries agent, which Stephen will talk about, you're in the game, and then that knows how to issue to the wallet. And then the verifier service, well, they spoke OpenID Connect. The wallet was able to present the credential to the OpenID Connect authenticator, and they were able to gain access to the service. So. I think this might be a good point to hand off to Steve, and I hope I left you enough time. Hey, John, do you want to open it for any questions? Sure. Just in case. If we have time, I'm happy to answer some questions. And I will stop sharing. All right. Um, Fernando can translate if you want. Oh, no, it's just to, it came to talking. Thank you, John. It was awesome. And after I had some considerations to talk with you. Thank you, John. Your turn, Stephen. Okay. All right. So I'm going to share my screen as well. Let me know when you can see that. It's good. We're up. Okay, good. All right, um, this is a presentation we've done a couple of times. We did this at the Hyperledger Global Forum in, uh, in Phoenix the last day before the world shut down. And um, we did this as well at, U as U at UBC. Uh, I've got the slides here. I was going to share the, the deck um, with anyone who, who's interested. The slide um, uh, URL is up here, so you can jump to it. A um, couple of one other thing to mention: uh, there's a couple of Linux Foundation edX courses that I'm the co-author of, and there's links down here in case you're interested in learning a lot more about the the ideas and the technology behind this. Um, okay, so let's talk about Hyperledger Aries and how this relates to what John talked about. <clears throat> I'm going to talk. I'm only going to go. I, I, so I. I didn't create a special presentation for this. I've included a lot of this, the whole deck, because there's demos and presentations that you can go through. This is basically a half to three quarter day presentation. So I'm just going from the start of it. So I'm gonna go as far as talking about agents and, le and ledgers and what goes on a ledger, what goes on the blockchain that we're talking about. So that's what I'm gonna go through. The projects themselves, um, focus on Aries agents and what they allow you to do, and then talk about um, as far as um, what goes on the ledger. And then lots more information in the slide deck um, if you're interested to follow on more. So this is the Hyperledger greenhouse. Um, folks have seen this before. So the projects that um, are related to what John um, talked about are these ones. So started with Hyperledger Indy back in the beginning, um, Hyperledger Indy is the blockchain element of this, and there is a blockchain element, obviously. It's why it's part of Hyperledger. It's very different from Fabric um, and, and basically the other um, blockchains within the Hyperledger community in that it is focused entirely on identity. It does not is not a general purpose. It's actually built on a general purpose blockchain, but is exposed as a very limited purpose um uh, uh blockchain it has for instance no smart contracts it doesn't exchange value it's really a way to distribute keys when you get really down to it it's a way to distribute public keys and associate those public keys with an entity uh, and, a, and, a, and a way to find out who controls those public keys um Indy in the beginning had all of the pieces to it, the blockchain, the crypto, um, the client code, and it was all in one project. Um, over time, they realized, hey, this, the crypto involved in this is, is pretty open, so 
let's uh, enable URSA and let's put the crypto into that and take it out of Indy. And then other projects within Hyperledger started to use it. And then the second was Aries, which is um, verifiable credentials are going to be a global massive thing. Indy will not be the only implementation of a ledger to, to host the keys, uh, the, the data necessary, and it won't be the only verifiable credential format. So um, we enabled, uh, so we split out the project into Aries, which is the client end of it, the agent piece of it. And so those components came out of Indy, or um, they're in the process of coming out of Indy and going into Aries. And then Aries contains a whole lot more, which is a bunch of protocols for how you how you exchange credentials amongst other things. John, you didn't show the trust over IP stack, um, which leaves me at a at a disadvantage because I assume John would have talked about this. But this is um, John is the executive director of the the, the new Linux Foundation Trust over IP um, project. Um, so it's a a sibling project, parallel project to Hyperledger. And it's about trust over IP. So what we're talking about here, this is the trust over IP stack, which is two parts, technical and governance. John talked a lot about governance and technical. Um, at the lowest layer, layer one, um, you've got bid utilities. This is the ledger part of it. Layer two is agents that communicate to allow you to, you know, the example, there were two agents in what John presented. There was the mobile agent, um, that he held in his hand, and then there was the server side of it, in this case, the law society that issued the credential, and the um, Ministry of Justice that, that verified the credential. So those are all instances of agents. They are layer two. And then the, 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 the next layer up is layer three, which is the same picture, this, this um, verify the issuer, the holder, and the verifier. So those same three trans uh, or, sorry, same participants that John talked about throughout his presentation. And then on top of that, finally, is the applications themselves. You have this ability to exchange credentials, but the law society wants to issue them and the Department of Justice and Ministry of Justice wants to consume them. That's a digital trust ecosystem. As John mentioned, governance is on all levels of those parts. So um, from a project perspective, bringing this back to Hyperledger, the layer one did utility, that is Indy. And as well, Indy also provides implementation of verifiable credentials, this ability to exchange, to sign credentials, to issue them, and then to be able to verify them crypto cryptographically. So that's the uh, indie layer. The Aries layer is sort of two and three. Two is the actual connectivity, the communication between agents, how John was able to have a, a QR code come up on the screen, have the uh, mobile phone scan that and be able to see it. And then um, under, uh, let's see, um, if you recall, I had um, Indy as being a single type of DID utility on the lower level. Aries also encompasses being able to talk to multiple DID utilities. So while Aries does not have the DID utility, Aries is not the ledger itself. Aries uses uh, interactions with the ledger to be able to ground the trust in the cryptography, to, to execute the, tr the cryptography. And then the last part of Aries is, Aries is a bunch of protocols. To issue a credential, that's a protocol. To verify, to request a proof and to receive that proof and verify it, that's a protocol that gets executed between agents. Those are just a couple. There's actually uh, about, I don't know, about 20 or 25 protocols that are in common use in Aries. So, and, and that can be arbitrarily expanded. So protocols are what agents execute. Once you have a communication path, you have protocols that allow them to accomplish a shared business goal. So that's Aries. And then URSA, throughout all of these layers, there's cryptography involved. And so URSA is that piece of it. So um, that's the two ways of looking at what the projects are involved. 
Um, I noticed from the beginning that in the documentation section that I saw earlier, while I couldn't understand a whole lot of what was being said, I did notice it really focused on fabric. So um, really would be excited if you'd focus some more on Aries and Indy and do some of the internationalization on, on, on the documentation within that. So there's my pitch to, to move over to where, you know, the action's really happening. Um, this is kind of how it lays out. Um, it's pretty typical of what you would see in a blockchain solution. You've got um, the validator pool is the ledger itself. Um, Indy is a, a public permissioned network. That means public, meaning anyone can read from the from the um, uh, from the ledger. They can. Uh, submit requests to read data from it, but only uh, permission set are allowed to write to it as well rather than having miners um, like Bitcoin or Ethereum does to um, write the transactions the it's a permission um, ability to actually create um, blocks on the ledger so to create the transactions on the ledger is also a constraint uh, limited to a, a very small number um, this observer pool on the outside, that's a scaling feature that's actually not yet implemented, but the idea there would be reads overcome writes. There's way more reads being done than writes, therefore you want to have a way to scale that. Um, outside are the agents that we talked about. These are edge agents. These would be agents that are owned by entities. So um, obviously these, are, these ones are owned by individuals that have wallets that exchange credentials, for example. And then this would be an enterprise. The example in the corner would be an enterprise one. Now, it looks like this is saying that if there's a cloud connection in between these agents talking to the uh, ledger and not talking to the ledger, that's not quite the, the way it works. So in fact, all agents talk directly to the, 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 the um, nodes of the ledger. So when they need to write data to it or need to read data from the ledger, they would contact the ledger directly. Um, where these come in is to enable a connection between two. So this um, enterprise uh, a server might have a cloud agent that it uses. Messages flow, although the message is um, logically going directly from the server to the mobile phone, um, there are there could be multiple hops in between that. So this is not working like an HTTP uh, connection where there's a request response between these two, but rather a peer-to-peer -peer method where data flows between them um, via asynchronous messages. So that's how that works. Um, often, there's no need for this cloud agent, these mediators, um, on the enterprise side. So in fact, the way it would work was this. This mediator is a persistent endpoint for a mobile agent, and um, a enterprise agent would talk directly. This is the um, persistent um, endpoint of the mobile agent. And there's a bunch of reasons why you have this, these paths through the network, these multiple hops. Most of it is to do with privacy and the ability to do um, um, not not enable correlation between um, it, between the interactions that you're doing, and we can talk a bit more about that as we go. Um, John mentioned this before. Didcom protocol is what is used. We haven't even mentioned the word did yet, but decentralized identifiers. These are the mechanisms that allow this distribution of keys. So the Didcom protocol is used to establish and communicate across it. And then running on top of the DIDCOM protocol is the various protocol, the ARIES protocols that allow you to accomplish some business goal, exchange a credential, issue a credential, a request a proof and receive one. Um, an ARIES agent uh, has a specific architecture, basically got two parts. Um, the framework, which is uh, something that generally is somebody else's problem, somebody like us. We build, we build a framework, um, one called Aries uh, Cloud Agent Python. So we've got a, a, a Python framework. 
Um, and then a controller. This is the thing that's your problem if you're if you're building an agent. This is the controller has the business logic. So the framework sort of handles all the the uh, the standard actions of sending messages and, and things like that. The controller says, oh, I want you to send a message now and I want it to have this content. So the controller is the business um, and the framework is, uh, is the worker doing the, um, doing the business on behalf of, uh, doing the actions on behalf of the controller. So look something like this. Um, the framework talks to the distributed ledger when necessary. The framework talks to other agents. Um, it's using DIDCOM protocols to do this. It's using, uh, it happens to use for an indie network, zero MQ um, to talk to the ledger. Note, note that though this distributed ledger could be other than indie, there's um, frameworks that talk, for instance, to Fabric as the ledger. Um, DIDCOM protocols are used. So once uh, an event comes in, a message comes in from another agent, that's going to be a DIDCOM protocol. And what that'll do is it'll fire an event to the controller to say, hey, I just got this message from this agent. What do you want me to do about it? And so that's the handoff from the framework that does the mechanical work of exchanging messages and constructing messages and sending them from the business logic, which the controller is, the thing that, that you as an agent writer might create. So. The framework sends events to the controller. The controller figures out what to do and then uses a REST API to say, hey, framework, go send this message to this agent in response to the previous one we got. So it's that, that's the basic architecture of how an agent works. And so generally how people, um, developers get involved in this is they pick a framework they want to use. Um, and, and I'll show uh, on the screen a couple, uh, in a later slide, a couple of examples of the frameworks. And then they write um, the business logic to do what they need it to do. Um, so business logic on this side could be, as I said, um, the, the controller might be a user interface on a web phone and the rest of the controller is me using my phone to do things. So that's what John was demonstrating um, as well. Uh, it could be a back-end system. It could be like an education system where, uh, or the BC Law Society system, where it has already an application that tracks who the members are, and it's using that to figure out how to, how to, um, how to, re how to receive events and how to respond to them. So, the business logic can be tied to anything. One of our goals, one of John's goals when we started doing this was we did not want to have to change every system in the government to be able to use this. We wanted to make the, the transition to this as easy as possible. So that's the idea here is that you have a relatively lightweight controller and it integrates with whatever backend system already exists and it continues to operate as it, as it needs to. Um, this is the list of the available frameworks. Um, Indie-based Aries Cloud Agent Python uh, is the one we've uh, at the BC Gov have created and now we're getting lots of contributions from basically around the world. Um, so uh, it is primarily used, uh, Akapai, because it's Python, cannot really be used as a mobile agent. So it's only used generally as enterprise agents. Um, it's designed as a standalone component, usually running in Docker, uh, as a Docker container. So the controller just talks to an HTTP interface. Um, so the controller can be in any language you want. It's not constrained to Python. And we've got people who are doing lots of Node and, and um, using other, all sorts of other tools for, for um, building the controller part of it. Um, AriesFramework.net is the second one that's, that's pretty popular. That um, was one that Trinsic, which um, John demonstrated, they used to be called StreetCred. They created the AriesFramework.net. Um, the nice part about it is it can be used in an enterprise context, but it also, um, through the use of Xamarin, can be embedded in mobile. And so it's made the most inroads into um, agents, uh, mobile agents. Um, it's not the ideal uh, environment for doing mobile technology, but it gives you all of the Aries components you need to be able to build a wallet. Um, 
unlike Akapai, it is a library that gets embedded into whatever your controller is. So you still have a controller in the framework. It's just rather than them being two separate components, um, the framework is embedded in the uh, Football. Um, these are the indie-based ones. So, as we met, as I mentioned earlier, Aries sort of spun out of indie, and although it was in, it is intended to talk to other um, ledgers and other frameworks, many of the first implementations have all been based on indie, and all of this work here is based on indie. Um, the Aries framework Go team took a different approach. They wanted all the richness and goodness that Aries has. And, and to make use of the same protocol and be able to work with these agents. But they wanted to make it a native Go and not tied to Indy. So um, they've built uh, a non Indy version. It talks to, frame, uh, to um, Fabric as a ledger, amongst other things. Um, entirely native Golang, so it does not have Ursa in it, does not have any Indy components in it. And it compiles to WASM, runs in a browser, and has all sorts of interesting, you know, JSON LD based credentials rather than indie credentials and so on. Um, if you're interested in, air, in indie, one of the things we frequently hear is people get interested in indie, um, and it is in a release state. Aries is not in a production state or a, a 1.0 state, but Indie or Aries embeds Indie if you're using any of these frameworks. So if you're interested in Indie at all, you really want to start with Aries and start with a framework um, that embeds Indie um, to enable interoperability across the ecosystem. So that's some advice there. Um, how's time? I could go on for, I've got another section that I wouldn't mind doing. Uh, Fernando, am I okay with time? Well, it's okay, Stephen. You can still with your presentation. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll take a little bit longer and go into a couple more things. The paper credential model, John touched on this, um, been used for literally thousands of years, started to get into question in 1970 because people could print their own paper and suddenly the, the technology for printing suddenly became possible and made this um, John talked about this, the issuer holder credential model. Um, to be very explicit about what the cryptography does, and it's the same thing that the paper credential model does. When, you, when, uh, when Mary here presents a credential, um, it proves who issued the credential um, because they look at the permit and they see what name is printed on it or, or whatever. There's some way to prove who issued it. Um, who holds the credential, that there's somehow a binding between the credential and Mary to show that it's her credential, that it was issued to her. Could be a picture on it, could be her address, could be just typed in her name, depending on um, the trust in the piece of paper. And then finally, there's some way, and this is probably the trickiest of all, which is the verifier can look at it and know that it's a valid document and that the claims are unchanged and that nobody's messed with any of the typing or changed anything in it. When, when, a, you know, when a border patrol agent is looking at your documentation to get on a flight, those are the things they're looking at. Who issued it? Does the picture look like you? And therefore, they know it's yours. And does it look like it's been tampered with or it's even an entirely fake passport? Those are the things they're trying to prove. Um, we're doing that exactly the same thing, except with cryptography here. And one of the things we don't, and, 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 and so we're proving the same thing. We can do one more real-time check, which is we can add that the claims have not been revoked. So unlike a piece of paper, um, you can check in real time whether it's been revoked. One of the key things here is that when we're doing this verification and including this real-time check, but this online digital, the, the verifiers are not going back to the issuer in real time. They're not saying, 
hey, I got this credential. Can you confirm with me it's right? They're, they're using cryptography to do that. And this is where the ledger comes in. The, the keys and other pieces of data they need to prove the credentials come from the ledger. The credential comes from Mary. The credential does not go on the ledger. It comes from Mary, but the keys necessary to prove the credential, to verify it's, it's um, these, these four things, largely come from the ledger. Um, this then leads you to the same issue, whether you're a, a, a person looking at a paper document or you're looking at, a, at a, a verifiable credential that's digital. Do you trust the issuer? Mary got this issued document from somebody. Um, it, maybe it's her um, transcripts from university. She got it from a university. Do you trust that that's a real university? That's a governance question, and that comes back to what John talked about with the entire governance um, um, side of the trust over IP stack. Um, Indy has one other cool thing that I'm going to talk about, and this is where I'll, I'll probably end it, is um, zero-knowledge proofs. So zero-knowledge proofs are super interesting because this really cuts down in correlation and does a couple of things. So what Indy can do is rather than it, in order to prove, to bind um, the credential to you, often what's done is a an identifier that's associated with you is embedded in the credential and so that when so that you can prove at the same time that the credential was issued to you. What Indy does is it's able to prove that without exposing that identifier that uniquely identifies you. So that's pretty powerful. That means that if I present this to Facebook and then I present it to Google, they can't go behind my back and compare them and connect my data together. So this surveillance um, approach is limited. That's one value of zero knowledge proofs in the most basic. There's two other things. Another is selective disclosure. When I have a credential and I present it as a piece of paper, the verifier can see everything on that credential. When I go to a bar and I prove my age, they can tell that I have brown eyes. They don't really need to know that. They can tell what my address is. They don't really need to know that. Selective disclosure allows you to prove the four things you need, but not prove, but not present all of the data. So you you constrain how much data you're sharing about yourself with the verifier. So selective disclosure number one tied to Indy's zero knowledge proof capability. You still are proving all of the other things that it's bound to you, that it was issued by the province, that or, or issued by the issuer that not, nothing's been tampered with, but you're not proving all of the other pieces of data that are on the credential. Then the second thing are what are called predicate proofs. And this is uh, a, an even more interesting one. So I can prove that I'm old enough to drink at a bar, but I don't have, and I can do that based on the date of birth that's in a credential, but I don't have to give that date of birth. All I say is, yep, old enough. And that's, uh, and, and so that's another capability of um, Indy zero knowledge proof capability. There's a link here at the bottom. I did a meetup a while ago that talked about the um, high school edition math um, to do with zero knowledge proofs and how they actually work. It's actually quite similar for those who are familiar with Diffie Hellman and things like that. It's kind of cool and kind of fun. This is, uh, I present this at the high school level. So as long as you have high school math, you can probably um, deal with it. With that, um, the last one I was going to mention, which goes on the what goes on the ledger, and I, I, I want to highlight one last thing here. So, on the ledger, um, it's kind of interesting because the um, only an issuer needs to have anything on the ledger, which is kind of interesting. So, um, they need to have four things. Um, the fourth being part of revocation, if that's supported. Um, the uh, basically that tells some things, but with these, there are um, you could issue with just three transactions onto the ledger, three data elements on the ledger. You can issue millions of credentials. 
That is all you need on the ledger. You don't have to have anything else. Um, which brings us to the key, no credentials go on the ledger. So no private data on the ledger, nothing that you would not want others to be able to see goes on the ledger. If you are an issuer, you are putting basically your keys and how to get access to those keys um, and some metadata about the credential that you issue and that's it, nothing else. Um, very crucial that you understand that we think it's a really, really bad idea to have any data about a private data about a person on a public ledger. And so none of that goes on the ledger. A lot of people think that when a, a credential is issued, it, it's not issued to the person, it's issued to the ledger. It is not issued to the ledger, it's issued to a person. And with that, I'll wrap up and, and, and leave it. I've probably gone too far, so hope that's okay. Back to you, Fernando. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, John, John. I think it was uh, an awesome presentation for you guys. Uh, the first presentation of John Jordan, I thought, I think it was very interesting to see how it's important to talk about the governance of uh, ecosystem to, you know, uh, bring the trust to make this ecosystem uh, be, uh, uh, I mean, if you create this credential, uh, this verifiable credential, you don't think it's a very important thing about the governance and how you can make uh, all the points be trust in the condition that is issued, uh, it, does not, it doesn't work uh, pretty well. So it's very interesting, the case, a uh, great demo. And taking Stephen to show us more about the concept and the framework that is uh, developed at, uh, at this time with Hyperledger. And, and I also like to invite everyone here, developers, um, you know, of their self-story identity, to join us the Hyperledger and to start to develop this uh, amazing project, you know, to create software identity. Thank you guys again. Bom pessoal, queria agradecer também a participação de todos nesse evento. Muito legal aí nós podemos né, estar conversando sobre identidade de forma centralizada aqui no grupo. É um tema aí que eu acho muito interessante. Uh, eu queria agradecer também o pessoal do CERP, que está ajudando muito a gente lá no, no grupo de identidade centralizada a todo o apoio do pessoal do CPQD também, né? E nós estamos desenvolvendo coisas bem interessantes ali de área centralizada. Passamos aí 10 minutinhos, mas eu acho que a apresentação foi muito boa, não, não quis interromper, porque eu achei que o conteúdo foi realmente muito relevante. Algum espaço para pergunta, Fernando? É, olha, já estourou o tempo, tá? Se alguém quiser fazer alguma pergunta, fica à vontade, a gente tem mais alguns minutos fazer um, umas duas para os nossos convidados. Fique à vontade. É, talvez algumas considerações a respeito da importância da identidade é, auto-soberana nesses frameworks de legislação tipo LGPD, GPDR. Não sei se dá tempo de comentar alguma coisa. Bom, aqui eu acho que sim. Ah, eu vou passar para o Stephen também, para o John Jordan, essa pergunta. Stephen, Stephen and John, we have some considerations here about the uh, use of uh, this technology uh, regarding to the or the GDPR Brazilian law here is called as LGPD, LGPD. So we have some considerations about the use of self sovereign identity with the, the you know this kind of privacy and data laws like GDPR. I'm having trouble hearing you. You're cutting out for me. I'm not sure. Um, so I, I missed. I th missed the question. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes, we had Give a, a try. question. Okay, thank you. I had a question about the uh, use of self story identity uh, with the uh, privacy and data laws like GDPR laws. Lord, you know, uh, how you can use the yeah. software identity, how it is, is regarding this law. Yeah, so the, the, the cool thing about this is that um, the data that is provided goes to the 
the, the subject of the data. So there's no GDPR um, context for that. So the company that is issuing the credential is operating as it always did. Um, however, instead of giving data about a subject directly to some other party, they're giving it to the person themselves, and that person can then share them as they wish. So from a GDPR perspective, it's, it's way better because you're, you're handing the data to the person that, uh, that is the subject of the data. Um, so that's part one. Um, part two is there's some question as to whether the identifier for um, what I call the did of the issuer, so that goes on the ledger. And there was, there's some question as to whether that data that identifies if, if a holder, the person who receives the, the data, also has to have a date on the ledger. There's some question as to what the GDPR ramifications of that are, is. Um, however, um, within the, the holder of the data does not have to have anything on the ledger. It's only the issuer that has to. So again, no GDPR issues there. So um, gener in, in general, GDPR is, is handled in a much better way as a result of this. Now, one last thing. When you provide data in the form of a proof to some other party, it's exactly the same as if you typed it in on the screen and they received it. Once you do that, they have the data. Um, what they do with it is um, up to them as to uh, how they behave, how they share it, and to follow the GDPR rules. Does that answer the question? Great answer. Thank you, Stephen. Okay. Uh, também é interessante ressaltar né, que, que o conceito da identidade soberana, como o Stephen falou, é importante reformar isso. Não vai nenhum dado pessoal para a Ledger, tá? Uh, esses dados ficam armazenados nas suas credenciais, na Ledger ficam apenas aí, alguns esquemas, estruturas de dados que são usados para gerar essa Ledger, e também chaves públicas dos emissores de alguns verificadores. Então, uh, eu acho que essa tecnologia, na verdade, ela vai ao encontro da LGPD, vai ao encontro da DPR, a partir do momento que ela coloca o usuário no controle da identidade, e ele decide como e com quem compartilhar seus dados. Tá? Isso, é um, isso é bem interessante, eu acho que é um reforço aí para a LGPD, vem agregar com a LGPD, com leis como a GDPR. Mais alguma pergunta, pessoal? Mais alguma consideração a colocar? Ok. Thank you, Steven. Thank you, John. It's all, guys. Okay. Uh, now I'm awesome. asking to Paulo. Paulo, if you'd like to finish the event. Paulo, você está nos ouvindo? Olá, olá, tô, tá me ouvindo agora? Tá me ouvindo? Sim, te ouço bem. Ah, legal. Sim, estamos te ouvindo. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Uh, pessoal, uh, mais uma vez, foi maravilhoso. Uh, quero agradecer a Fernando por esse maravilhoso trabalho no Work Group. Agradecer ao Renato pelo trabalho também espetacular que a gente tem no Work, no work Group de Documentação. Re, reiterar que nós temos o objetivo de compartilhar conhecimento, crescer a comunidade, ajudar, apoiar. Todos que queiram trabalhar com Hyperledger, Foundation. Próxima semana a gente vai ter um meetup da organização do capítulo. Convido a todos a participarem. A gente vai divulgar através do meetup, através do do, como se fosse um meetup, né? mas vai ser uma reunião nossa né? de organização. Todos estão convidados a participar e opinar e ajudar a gente a melhorar e fazer um trabalho melhor para todos. É, reitero que a gente está querendo lançar esse, o Special Interest Group para mercado 
a indústria de energia e queremos também lançar um work group para focado em incentivar, inspirar as mulheres a participarem mais, tá? Não é uma política afirmativa, é apenas inspiração. E a gente quer inspirar a todos, a, a todos nós a fazer melhor. Obrigado a todos. É, espero que tenham gostado. Fernando, Madeira, Carlão, Risqueoto, Renato, quem quiser aí dar, terminar aí, dar, fazer algum comentário, alguma é, finalização, esteja à vontade. Muito bom, pessoal. Não, realmente só agradecer aí ao, ao Fernando pela organização, né? trazer o pessoal para falar com a gente é sempre muito bom. E, de novo, reiterar o convite para todo mundo participar dos próximos, sugerir temas, sugerir voluntariar para fazer apresentação, né? para fazer palestra, para tocar ideia aí com a gente. Legal. Até o próximo. Aí. Valeu, pessoal. Boa noite. Isso, pessoal. Muito obrigado. Temos muito conteúdo aí. Hyperledger sempre oferecendo realmente muita plataforma, muito conteúdo. Estamos sempre abertos aí, tanto para apresentar, para receber aí apresentadores. Então, agradeço também aí a Fernando e, como sempre, aí os organizadores também, meus colegas. Olá, então, pessoal, que tenha uma, o resto, uma excelente semana. Até a próxima semana, se Deus quiser. E vamos com tudo.